trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness, nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses in God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. What a description of a minister. What a description of any Christian. This is a description that God wants to be spoken of every one of his children. Now let's begin in verse 1. He says, you know our entrance unto you that is not in vain. Now it's sad that the Thessalonians needed to be reminded of these things, but to be fair, we don't know how intense the charges were. More than likely very intense. Uh, the Jews hated him enough to run him out of town, so I'm sure they hated him enough to try to slander him in any way they could. So they, would try, they wouldn't just tell him things that the Thessalonian believers could not believe. They would mention things that were believable. Things that they couldn't, well, maybe, uh, would be their response. So God inspired Paul to write this defense. And out of this defense, we learn what it means to walk worthy of God. How Paul uh, strove to reproduce himself in the lives of these believers. Now, <clears throat> we see what a servant of Christ should be. We see the credibility of Paul's writings are greatly enhanced by his testimony. That's why it was important to him uh, to answer the charges. Sometimes the best defense against slander is to answer only one or two of the um, slanders that are projected, but Paul gives a lengthy list of rebuttals. He wanted to be absolutely clear who he was, why he came, and what he was striving to accomplish. Now, in verse 1, when he says it was not in vain, he's saying that, that his efforts in Thessalonica were not empty. They were not useless, as the Jews would try to say. So apparently the Jews were trying to convince the Thessalonians, oh, he didn't know what he's talking about. Well, he had no business being here. We have our own synagogue. We have everything in control. Now, though he was only there for three weeks, it was because of them, but yet they used that against him. He was only here three weeks. What does, that mean? what does that matter? Why would you just turn your thinking upside down as far as your, your religion would be concerned? So he didn't leave because he got what he could, could get from them. He left because of the persecution that was there. Verse 2. Even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. Paul remained bold even though he was rejected, even though he literally suffered. He was beaten at Philippi and placed in prison. And then after that experience, and then, of course, we know the story, how they sang at midnight even though their backs were hurting and they were cramping from the stocks. Yet they were singing at midnight. God brought an earthquake and delivered them. And the Philippian jailer was saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thus was the beginning of the church in Philippi. Now, he was still hated by the Jews and they ran him out of town. But that did not modify his approach to preaching the gospel. He still came to Thessalonica with a boldness of spirit, 
in spite of the contention, in spite of the resistance, in spite of his literal suffering, he still boldly proclaimed, Thus saith the Lord. He was more concerned about what God had said than about what men wanted him to say. Now this is an indication of the power of the Spirit-filled life. We see in the book of Acts, whenever the disciples prayed for boldness, they were filled with the Spirit and then went out and spoke boldly. Those who are yielded to the control of the Holy Spirit are more concerned with what God has said and His compassion for the lost than they are about their own comfort zone. He was motivated by love for His Lord and Savior, as we read earlier in praise time. He saw the lost as God sees them. God loves them. He wants them to be with Him in heaven, and if we love Him, we will want it too, enough to where we would get out of our comfort zone to try to speak to them of their need of a Savior. He was willing to suffer, and he still kept on preaching the gospel with boldness. He was convinced that this is what these folks needed more than anything else in the world. He knew the results of believing in Christ. And he decided it was worth the risk to tell them. So he came and he preached even though the contentions followed after him. Would that all of us could see the lost as Paul did. Uh, we have no kind of persecution like he faced. The lost are still loved by God just as much he still wants them to be with him in glory. Brethren, we need to have goals for three families, three people that we, our family, could minister to to try to get to them, to communicate to them the gospel, to show them compassion in any way we can, and then to, to be praying for them, looking for an opportunity, looking for the right timing to present to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Brethren, soul winning today has to be based upon relationships. When you think about it, that's real soul winning anyway. Winning a person to acknowledge the Lord Jesus for who he is and their need of him. Now, in verse 3, he talks about his exhortation. God tells us to exhort one another, and Paul was exhorting the Thessalonians but his exhortations were not of deceit or uncleanness or guile. The word deceit is speaking of there was no errors or misunderstanding from God. He knew what God had said, and he spoke to them, Thus saith the Lord. And it was truth. Further, no uncleanness. He was absolutely pure. No doubt that the Jews who hated him would try to spread rumors that, that, he, was, that he was an immoral man that he would try to steal from the church funds. Uh, but he's making it clear here that was not the case in any shape, form, or fashion. Then he says, no, uh, no guile, speaking of deceit. He wasn't using trickery. He wasn't using deceit. He wasn't trying to um, convince them of something to fulfill a personal agenda. He was not a kingdom builder. He was not trying to gain a following for himself. He wanted them to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, that our efforts at telling others of Christ would reflect the Spirit. This desire to hold forth. Oh, look at what God has done. Look at who He is. Look at what He said. And how He loves you and wants you to be with Himself. Paul was who he was. He didn't try to impress anyone otherwise. He was just simply telling them what God had said. Then in verse 4, Paul speaks of how God worked in him. The word allowed and the word trieth at the end of the verse are essentially the same word with different meanings uh, because of the context. In the word allowed, we see, as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak. That means that God had examined him and found him to be fit for ministry. The basis of ministry is a heart that's walking with God, so that as he examines the heart, then that person can more effectively minister. 
Now, that's not just speaking of preachers and evangelists. That's speaking of folks in the pew as we seek to minister to one another. The key to being effective in ministering to others is to have a walk with God in such a way that as God examines us, He sees that we are fit, as it were, to serve Him in ministering to others. And then when he talks about trying our hearts, it speaks to the fact that as Paul ministered, he continued, God continued to examine him. And he continued to find that he remained fit. In other words, Paul had his priorities right. Number one was his walk with God. Number two was his ministry to others. Now, it's important that we understand any efforts to encourage other believers needs to be rooted in our walk with God. Now, I don't know about you, but I think every one of us, I know I do, we recognize that, man, I, I'm not fit for anything. How God can have any patience with me, I don't understand. I mean, if I was God, I'd have given up on me a long time ago. And that's not what God is talking about. He is, he is saying that as we have a heart that sincerely loves him, putting the past bega- behind us, like Paul said, he said, forgetting that which is behind and pressing forth to that which is before, recognizing that God has a purpose for me now to serve him today as well as tomorrow. And Paul recognized that God had examined him and was continuing to work in him. Now, notice he says, put in trust with the gospel. His task for his Savior was to preach the gospel. It's a message that God has entrusted to us all. Think about this. Not only should we be speaking to others, but we have been entrusted with this message where we have come to know him and God is trusting us to communicate that message to others who still need to know who he is and what he has done. God is trusting us to learn the gospel well, to understand it thoroughly, and to tell others. In other words, study, prepare, even practice. But make sure you're communicating the word of God. How God longs for every one of his children to emulate Paul's boldness. That's why God inspired us to write. Paul isn't giving a bragamony here. Paul is simply telling folks that's this is how God has worked in him and how he wants every one of us to yield to God so that he can work this in us as well. He wasn't interested, he says, not as pleasing men, but God. He wasn't interested in pleasing God or pleasing men. He was out to please God regardless of the test. Boy, I can get my tongue wrapped around all kind of ways. <clears throat> but the point is, he was not a men pleaser. He did not preach to tickle their ears, to entertain them, to make them feel good about themselves. He just simply proclaimed the truth. Then it was up to them what they were going to do with it. Pressures were applied to get him to shut up, but he didn't care about those pressures. He was more concerned with thus saith the Lord than he was about how how people felt about him. Verse 5. Neither at any time used we flattering words nor a cloak of covetousness. Now, they knew that, and it's a shame that he had to remind them. But God wanted us to see this. He was not a flatterer. Flattery is to compliment in things that we had nothing to do with. For example, if a man compliments a woman for her beauty, God is the one that made her that way. Why compliment her? But when, when there's a compliment for, when she accomplishes something and he compliments her, that is absolutely appropriate. As I congratulated Anna, it was for her accomplishment. And we recognize that each of us, as we compliment each other, it needs to be about something that has been done, something that is valid, not something we had nothing to do with. We don't compliment folks for their intelligence their speed, their physical abilities, their strength. God's the one that made us that way. But we do recognize the need to encourage one another in areas in which they have been, uh, they have accomplished. 
Now, Paul didn't try to win them over to himself and then slip in the gospel. Um, Proverbs 26, 28 says, A flattering mouth worketh ruin. In other words, a flatterer, a flatterer is one that has an agenda. He's trying to make someone feel good so they can slip something into him or they can convince him to do something for his benefit, i.e., oftentimes salesmen may, may come across that way. Um, God says that's not what he was doing. That's not what Paul was doing. And that's what God does not, that's one thing God does not want us to do, to use in trying to minister to one another. Neither a cloak of covetousness. It, he wasn't an undercover sheep shearer. <laughs> um, he didn't use the ministry to try to get from them. Covetousness is willing to do anything to get what we can get to satisfy our own, st our own desires. To get anything that we can get that God has chosen to withhold from us at the time. Covetousness is not content with where we are. Covetousness is not trusting God. It is covetousness, God says, it is the same thing as idolatry. It is the worship of stuff. And God wants us to understand that Paul did not come to them with any kind of covetousness. It wasn't secret in any shape, form, or fashion. He wasn't trying to get out of them. He was there to serve God in proclaiming to them the gospel. In other words, Paul did not use the ministry to get all that he could get, and he said, God is witness. In other words, God is absolutely aware of those who are and those who are not. In verse 6, nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others. When we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ, they were not glory hounds. They were, he was not the sort of man who, who it was my way or the highway. He was not seeking to use people to build his church. Paul sought to use the church to build the people. Glory seekers in the ministry are effectively kingdom builders, something for themselves. Usually these type of men run roughshod and make demands over people in order to build their own recognition, their own fame. Paul did not do this. He did not throw his weight around because he could have. He was an apostle. Very few had that opportunity, that privilege. But he did not throw his weight around and make demands of the people. Paul's defense is a good basis of seeking ministry. This is the kind of pastors that God can use his way. But this also is a list of things that God wants every one of us to reflect. But he doesn't stop there. From verse 7 to verse 12, he describes his heart for the Thessalonians. Now, brethren, God has told us that by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, by the love that you have for one another. Paul manifested that love in a number of ways. Look at how he expresses it, beginning in verse 7. We were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. Gentle as a nursing mother, describing his loving care for the Thessalonians. He accepted them where they were as he sought to bring them to where they needed to be. There were times he had to correct them, but it was always in a gentle spirit. It wasn't with harsh demands. There can be no changes if changes are not taught, and they have to be taught with gentle suggestions and nudges and recognizing that this is God's command. Let's look at what he says and what he wants of us. Then in verse 8, he says, he describes himself as being affectionately desirous of them, even willing to die for them because they, were, they, they the Thessalonians, were dear to him and those that were ministering with him. To be affectionately desirous is speaking of the fact that he was longing for them to see Christ as he did. He knew the joy, the peace, the love that would come to them if they would. He used many terms of endearment throughout this passage. He wanted them to understand the magnitude of his love for them. Brethren, we need to learn to be open about communicating our love and affection for one another. That's not normal in our culture. I know that. 
But it is something that we, we need to be discreet, to be sure, but it is something that should be expressed as we fellowship together. And I praise the Lord for many of you who have and who do. But, I, but let's recognize that what Paul is exemplifying for us here is something God wants to see in all of us. Even willing to die for them. In other words, his love was a genuine self-sacrificial love that God had worked in him towards the Thessalonians. Paul was accurately reflecting the love of God who was willing to die for each one of us. And then he says, you were dear unto us. And he must have said it in such a way that they remembered it. Paul is reminding them of his expressions of love to them, that they meant a great deal to him, and that he had told them that. And he, he is just writing that which he is reminding them of. And then in verse 9, it speaks of how he labored during the day and he ministered in the evenings and weekends. Now, we know that the Scripture teaches the servant is worthy of his hire. Those who preach the gospel should live by the gospel. But God worked in Paul in a different way. He knew how Paul would be misrepresented by the Jews when he left. So, he, so Paul labored with his hands so as not to be a burden to the Thessalonians. He was a tent maker. And a part of the Jewish tradition was that a father was to teach his sons the discipline of obedience, teach them to, to, know, um, to know the first five books of the Bible, um, to know them well, memorize them, in fact, and then to teach them his trade. Apparently, Paul's father was a tent maker. And Paul followed suit, and he used that to provide for his needs as he ministered. And this gave Paul even more freedom as he preached. In verse 10, Your witnesses in God also how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that belief. That doesn't mean that he was excluding the unbelievers. <laughs> he didn't act differently among the lost, but, he, but this is how he lived his life. They could have seen that. Um, he could write of his holiness and just dealings with men, knowing that someone's not going to come back and say, wait a minute, Paul, Paul shortchanged me in this tent that he made me. No one was going to do that because he was adjust in his dealings. He reminded them that he was unblameable in that though there would be charges from those that hated him, there would be no charge that could stick. There was no truth in it. Their testimony among believers was always constant. In other words, that what they knew of Paul is what he was, and he expressed it often. Verse 11, as you know how we comforted and uh, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children. In, in verse 7, he was talking about uh, a nursing mom, a nursing mother. Here he's talking about the, uh, the work of the father, his watch care over the Thessalonians as a father would watch over his children. He exhorted them, which means to encourage them to live for God. He comforted them, also a name for the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, but also Paul was used to comfort the Thessalonian believers. And he charged every one of them. He gave testimony to them. He testified to them the truth of the Word of God. Now this more fatherly side of Paul is a bit sterner than in verse 7, the, the nursing motherly side. But he saw them as his own children to take care of, to watch over them. And so consequently, we see that he, he, that's how he treated them. Now, his purpose in being there is revealed in verse 12, and it's God's purpose that he wants to work in every one of us. Verse 12, that all of this, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. That ye would walk worthy of God. God wants us to work, walk worthy of our faith, of our profession. A walk that proves that we, we have a living faith in a living Savior who is working in us. A walk that demonstrates His power in us. 
This is why, this verse is why God inspired Paul to write the 11 verses prior to this. He wants us to understand what it means to walk worthy of God. Paul exemplified that, and God is saying, that's what I want to do in you. Now, as we look at what he's saying, we recognize that uh, he ministers so that they would walk worthy of God, and that's our goal as we seek to minister to one another. He encouraged uh, them as God wants us to cur- encourage one another to walk worthy of him and to bring others in so that they will also learn that walk as well. God has called everyone to come into his kingdom. Every believer is called into his kingdom, but every unbeliever is also called, but they haven't answered. One day that call will be rescinded when they have said no for the last time. When they have rejected him the final time, that call to them will be rescinded. He has called us all to his glory as well. Brethren, God is worthy of all glory that we can bring to him. And it it begins with the decision to believe on him. It continues as we learn to walk worthy of him. This is what God wants to do with us all. Now, in three separate verses, he mentions the gospel of God to them, the good news. The word gospel means good news. The good news from the good God to those of us here on this planet, every one of us. Many today don't feel that the gospel is that big a deal. But we need to be reminded that it was big enough for God to send his son to die for us. We will meet him, folks. We will either meet him as our Savior in this life, or we will meet him as our judge in the next life. And he lets us make up our mind, our own minds, what we're going to do with him. Our judgment as we stand before him will be based upon that single decision, as well as the good and bad done in this life. How God wants us all to depend upon him for the gift of eternal life so that we will not have to stand before the great white throne judgment. Many who have not trusted the Lord feel that really, you know, when you think about it, I'm as good as a lot of Christians I know. I'm good enough to be okay with God. But we need to understand that good people need Jesus too. Uh, Noble people need Jesus as well. Religious people need Jesus. In my own life, I was very religious it, it took like seven or eight years before I, I finally, God finally got through to me where I understood my need of a Savior. I was depending on myself. I, I compared myself with others, and I, I felt like I was doing just fine. But I was depending on me to get me to heaven, not on the Lord Jesus Christ. No amount of religion can ever make us good enough to be with God. God says that all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags to God. When we try to work our way to heaven, it serves as an insult to him. That's saying, Lord, your work's not good enough. I've got to do something too. After we trust him, certainly good works are part of our lives, but they serve to prove our love for him, not to get to heaven, but because we are going to heaven. After all that he has done to provide eternal life, how can anyone be justified in putting off the Lord Jesus Christ? How he loves you. How he loves every one of us and wants you to be a part of his family. No one is going to be justified in rejecting him. Now, what is this gospel that he's talking about? 1 Corinthians 15 tells us it's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. What we need to understand is that the thing that required the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ before anyone could go to heaven is the fact that God's holiness is so pure, so absolute, that he could not look upon our sin. That's why when Jesus hung on the cross, the Father turned his face away from him because my sin was there and he was repulsed just as was your sins. He is so holy he cannot even look 
upon our sin. So the problem is all of us are sinners. Some are worse than others, granted. But still the fact remains we all fall under the category we are all sinners. And something has to be done to remove that sin before we can ever be with a holy God like that. I mean, all, every sin has to be completely washed away. Every single sin we've ever committed. When the Lord sent His Son, only His death would satisfy His holiness. And only His death would satisfy His justice in that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In other words, His justice required that only God Himself could pay for our sins. How this proved His love and His grace. What love is this that God looked at man who is rebelling, going his own way, ignoring Him, and loved us enough to send His Son to pay the penalty for our sins Himself. I cannot grasp the magnitude of that kind of love. But yet he tells us, he makes it plain, that's, that's who he is. And his grace offers eternal life as a gift so that if we would trust in him, then immediately all of our sins would be placed on the cross and his righteousness would be given to us. Now how righteous is Christ? Perfect. His perfection would be counted to us. Now we still live in a nasty world in which we struggle with sin. But as far as our standing before God, we will be made perfect because His perfection, His righteousness is accounted to us. We receive that gift of eternal life only by faith. For by, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. His grace says to every one of us, here is eternal life. Will you trust me for what I have done for you? Faith is a life-changing decision that will cause us to pass from death unto life. This is something the Lord Jesus Christ as given, presented in the gospel is something that every bad person needs. We all know that. But brethren, it is something every good person needs too when, it compare, when we compare ourselves with others and think we're so good. But God tells us to compare ourselves to Him. And there's no wake. We come even close. We come short of being good enough to be with Him in glory. Saving faith is not just believing the facts about Jesus. I believe in George Washington, but I'm not trusting George to do anything for me. Saving faith is a life-changing decision that deals specifically with eternal life and the sin that keeps us from it. Trusting God to cleanse us as we trust Him for the gift of eternal life. It depends entirely upon Him plus nothing else to get us there to be with Him. That is the gospel. That is what Paul preached to the Thessalonians. That's what God wants every one of us to understand and to make that decision to receive the gift from a loving God that he offers to every one of us. Dearly beloved, this is how we enter into a walk with God. Then, as we learn more of him, we'll learn to walk worthy of him as he deserves. Now let me ask each of you this question. How is your relationship with God? Would you, would you try to say, oh, I'm, I'm okay. But upon what basis? How do you know that? Because this is far too important to just hope so. It is an absolute necessity that we know that we are made right with God because we have made that decision to trust Jesus as Savior. Are you really walking with Him or just following a religion? Know what the good God loves you and invites you to come to Him to enter into that walk. Once you have made that decision, then for every believer 
there is this question, are you walking worthy of your profession in him? Are you growing in your love for him and in your desire to serve him? Are you growing in these attributes that we discussed here, these attributes that God wants to work in each one of us? Are you becoming more like this as we strive to walk worthy of God? Let's bow our heads together for prayer. With every head bowed 